Good evening and welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am DM Bloodworth and as you can see by the graphics, uh, tonight's video is a session recap of our AD&D first edition campaign entitled The Keepers of Quescaton. Um, if you're familiar with AD&D lore or Dungeons and Dragons lore in, gen lore in general, um, the, the stronghold in the search of the unknown, so in B1, is Quescaton. And uh, 100 sessions ago, my party came together. Uh, it was at the time 10, uh, 10 player characters came together and they began their, uh, their adventure uh, into the world of Greyhawk, uh, specifically in the the country of Yomenri, and they began their questing uh, in and around uh, the Keep on the Borderlands and, and Quescaton. Uh, once they had gone into Quescaton and uh, delved in and out throughout the, the upper portions of the stronghold, uh, clearing it out of um, troglodytes and kobolds and, and other uh, nasties within there, they encountered uh, for the first time a, a dark druid by the name of Avante. And uh, they charmed him, uh, managed to um, managed to keep him in tow for uh, a good number of uh, you know adventures through throughout uh, and sessions throughout Quescaton until at one point he had escaped. Um, you know they left him you know unmonitored and and he slipped away. Now he's going to carry a lot of animosity towards them and uh, as they learn and unlock some of the secrets of Quescaton, they become charged in trying to figure out the, um, the machinations and exploits of Zeligar, the Archmage, and, uh, and Rogan, his fighter uh, companion. And these are, again, our two uh, two characters from uh, the lore of D and D, um, and they're specifically mentioned in uh, uh, the uh, B one and also B two as well. So they're they're integral to the uh, the near a uh, very old story of these you know stronghold and the surrounding region. And it's always been a mystery to the players uh, what role those, uh, you know, heroic figures, um, and and not in a, uh, not in the sense that they were good guys, but but just they they were folklorish type uh, characters, and um, the players have been following this trail for. A hundred sessions and uh, now they are predominantly uh, levels 8, 9 and uh, 1 tenth level character and uh, they have been adventuring all the way through uh, facing all kinds of challenges and so session 100 uh, I, I anticipated was going to be a um, their greatest challenge yet and uh, it did not, uh, you know, it did not let me down, and I don't believe it let them down either. They really enjoyed it. So, uh, without further ado, let me just bring up the the map, and you can see the the space that they were uh, combating in, and uh, and see what they were up against. So, I am going to switch views and bring you here. So, this of course is is the map and the uh, the dialogue that we were going through, uh, this is not 100% of the dialogue, and I just discovered something with Roll20 that you can actually view all of the chat entries for this game, which not just this session, but going all the way back to the very beginning. So I'm going to spend a little time picking through that, primarily for my players to actually look at 
how long this record actually goes. But here you have, um, so the players, as you saw in um, my last weekly update uh, and recap, they had delved into this portion of the, um, of the dungeon. They had killed several, you know, ghouls and a uh, wyvern and uh, a dark druid and some uh, monstrous uh, uh, zombie type creatures. And then they pushed over the wall and they came into this area here where they encountered a total of three more wyverns, three more dark druids, and a ancient plague dragon. All right, uh, let me take the uh, let me take the the condition, the dead condition, off of him, and uh, let me just expand this uh, this icon so you can kind of see what he looks like. So this was Syad the Plague Dragon. So this is what they were ultimately going to face, and you could see where his breath weapon had had come through and uh, and hit these these characters over here uh, once they were fighting him. Um, you know, so once they were fighting, um, really, really interesting battle. Um, the players began with this little combat down over here. And then once, once the Dark Druids were um, prevented from uh, doing anything because they had a, a silent spell put around them, this particular Dark Druid here was in the process of casting a Call Lightning spell, which the party was aware of, and their own Druid, uh, she was, uh, was working on utilizing that same Storm Cloud. So she was running, um, she was running about five rounds behind in trying to control the the clouds and do her own call lightning spell. The rest of the party was concentrating on um, taking care of the dark druids, taking care of the wyverns as, as they were swooping in and attacking them as well. And these are plague wyverns. So they were wyverns that uh, don't have a poisonous, um, a poisonous uh, stinger, but rather one that is injecting, uh, you know, disease and the goal was to control the Lost Library, which is a magical book cart that uh, belonged to Zeligar, the Archmage. And uh, it, was, it was rumored that um, he kept his spell books concealed inside uh, this children's, this wandering children's library. And the Dark Druids had learned that, and the Dark Druids had learned that uh, or suspected that um, by taking control of this library and uh, learning his secrets and his spell book that they would be able to control these monoliths that uh, Zeligar had placed throughout the region um, for purposes of summoning and, and such and, and it was Zeligar who at least from what they understood Zeligar was the creator of this plague dragon, the first of its kind in the world of Greyhawk. Uh, so the players are involved with this combat uh, with these dark druids, and they're pretty much holding their own. They're doing really, really well. They, um, you know, utilizing their spells well. They they disrupted the uh, call lightning of this particular dark druid um, and then they managed to kill him um, while his spell was disrupted sparrow the druid who was also trying to harness the same uh, storm cloud she became you know immediately aware that she was the one now in uh, in control of that storm cloud and so like I said she was by the time the battle was over, she was in her seventh round, so just three rounds away from actually being able to start to call lightning. Uh, once the battle was actually over, she uh, continued to maintain that um, 
that control over it and uh, then she started dropping um, lightning bolts down onto the dead wyverns because she wanted to destroy their bodies as well as the dark druids and the plague dragon uh, which was a corpse by that point as well and I'm gonna get to that story so the party is going back and forth throughout all of this combat here the dragon hadn't yet uh, made itself um, you know appear it was invisible during the beginning of the of the fight and it was uh, you know they're not quite sure where it was at the time but um, two of them did perceive the the shifting in the air as it came as it came in on them and then with its first breath weapon um, which actually came in through this midsection over here and hit some of the characters in here I'll, I'll go over that um, that was its first strike that's when they became aware of it and it was like a really holy crap moment you know here we are fighting off an ancient dragon um, that dealt 50 six hit points in its first breath weapon so the party was doing really well like i said uh amalric who is a um who is uh this character here and he is a fighter magic user and he scored the first crit of the day against the wyvern dealing um 19 points of damage and cutting off its wing um when he cut off its wing, it actually toppled off of uh, this this podium here. Um, you know, it had toppled off of here, and it actually fell onto the Dark Druid down at the bottom of this. He was then pinned to a, a certain point, and that is when um, that is when the Paladin actually. Um, no, I'm sorry, not a Paladin. That's when the um, the illusionist uh, Bernard uh, he had conjured up a ballista and he fired the ballista which pinned the dark druid uh, pierced him through the hand with a, a critical hit and pinned him to the ground and he was eventually slain throughout the fight so Amalric scored a critical hit killing the wyvern Angus scored um, Angus had a critical failure, stumbling and losing his, uh, his footing, so he lost his secondary attack and, um, as an archer, and then all of his next attacks in the next round. Then Breeze crit hit a wyvern, a wyvern uh, winging it. Uh, it fell and it died. Um, then Bernard did a critical hit with the ballista as I described. Um, Amalric had a critical fail uh, and, and he too lost his footing and um, you know had a minus to his AC for that, that following round and then at that point with the second druid being killed by Breeze the uh, killed by Breeze the uh, the cleric here that is when Syed fired his first breath weapon his breath his breath weapon hit for 56 hit points of damage hitting both Amalric who took 28 points of damage and Zane who took 28 points of damage so they both thankfully made their saving throw because the 56 hit points was enough to kill both of them if either of them failed. But because they took half their damage in one strike, they both had to make their um, they both had to make their uh, system shock checks. Uh, AD and D first edition has a rule that if you take your uh, half of your hit po your half of your maximum hit points in a single attack, you must roll. A uh, system shock check in order to survive it so this was actually numerically the 23rd and 24th system shock checks that any party member needed to make 
in order to survive an attack. So in a, in a hundred sessions, 24 sessions so far, or 24 instances so far, uh, included a player character uh, being just one roll away from death. Um, the battle continued going on. Angus hit another critical hit on the dragon, and this particular critical hit was a long shot. Um, you know, very, very uh, reminiscent of Bard's attack, and, and Angus is a Bard, uh, of Bard's attack on Smog, where it was a, it was a long shot. It was going to do um, 50 constitution points of damage, uh, or 50%, uh, 50 of the, the dragon's constitution in the first round, and then subsequent bleeding out over the next five rounds. So in the fifth round, the dragon would have died regardless of remaining hit points. So they kind of knew that they had the clock rolling with them. However, the dragon was still very much um, active for that time. Then um, Bernard had a critical fumble with his ballista basically shattering the illusion of the ballista. The second breath weapon hits. Now the second breath weapon is going to hit and you can see it here now. The second breath weapon hits and it's going to hit Mirador the Cleric, Candrius the Paladin, and Angus the Bard. So Candrius made his saving throw. He took 30 hit points of damage. It was a 60 hit, one hit point damage breath weapon. Mirador took 61 hit points of damage. He failed his uh, saving throw and it brought him uh, from, I believe he was around like 48 some odd hit points and it brought him to negative 14. Mirador was the first character uh, first PC, um, one of the first members of the Keepers of Quescaton, and he fell in this battle. Um, and then Angus took 30 hit points of damage, making his save. So the 25th system shock check, or, or death save, was, was made, and, um, and it was a fail. And so... Mirador dies. Uh, he would he was going to die regardless because uh, being brought to negative fourteen, really being brought to negative ten or anything beyond that, is a uh, is an instant death in a D and D first edition. We then go into the um, the aftermath. Now um, the the dragon itself was actually killed. All right um, by Angus with a with a 24 hit point shot, um, which actually killed the uh, killed the dragon at that point, and they happen to remember, and this is amazing. Um, they actually remembered it was it was actually um, it was actually a Malric uh, who was kind of like almost like the quartermaster of the party. He remembers what equipment virtually everybody has and he was like wait a second he says i remember that mirador back in a certain number of sessions ago uh, and it was somewhere in the 20 like 20 sessions prior to this he remembered that mirador the cleric had a clerical spell with Ray's dead on it and so they start rummaging through his his lifeless body, and they pull out the um, they pull out the scroll. And uh, fortunately, they have two clerics in this party, and they manage to uh, you know. So the second cleric, um, although he might make a demand that Mirador um, convert to his deity for doing this, um, with just a five percent fail chance uh, because the spell is one level above the clerics uh, in order to cast um, and 
he raised Mirador back to one hit point. So, um, you know, so he brought him back from the dead, raised him back to one hit point. He is incapacitated for the next week. They're debating wheeling him around in a wheelbarrow for the next week as they delve deeper into um, this abandoned keep at the time. And then they started delving into the lost library. Um, it's uh, it's anti-magic bubble having been dissipated with the with the death of the um, of the dragon, and uh, they gained access to the treasures, primarily the spell books that were within the lost library. Um, so throughout this entire particular, you know, this battle, um, it was back and forth. Uh, there was, you know, as I said, there was a total of, um, there were a total of four chances of characters dying uh, based on just one roll. Uh, one case where the character did die. Uh, and fortunately, like I said, they remembered that they had a, a, uh, a scroll to bring him back. If they didn't have the scroll to bring him back, he, he would he would be gone. Uh, and that would have been the the first true death in the in the party. So as I was going back and looking over this here, I did notice like I was like I couldn't find the um, the first I couldn't find the first uh, breath weapon. So here's my role with the second breath weapon, the 61 point breath weapon, uh, basically doing 12 d8 um, damage. And you can see, like, they were like, damn, you rolled so many eights <laughs> on this. It was just, it was just a, a very, very impactful, um, you know, obviously it could go all the way up to 96. The, the dragon had 96 hit points, uh, but this is the way that I do, um, this is the way that I do it. They get a, for every hit die they have, they do a D8 uh, breath weapon. So, um, anyway, they... You know, so I was going through and I was looking actually for the initial breath weapon attack. And I was like, wait, it, let me click on this here. So view all the chat for this game. When you click on that, when they say all chat from this game, it went all the way back to the very, very first session. So I, I couldn't believe that because I was like, wait, Jarrahawk, this is, um, this is word the um the magic user who was originally with the party so for my players looking at this now um the traveling rpg gamer um i think this was the dwarven fighter that was in the party so i mean this should really be a blast to some of the uh players who were initially with us Right, so uh, this was definitely word. Jarrow Hawk was definitely word. Uh, the traveling RPG gamer was, I'm pretty sure, the dwarven fighter that was with us. Here is Breeze, empty inside. Here is Mirador. So right from the very, very beginning, these uh, characters were with us. He's rolling his stats here. So this is a session zero. Uh, this is Vince, the Crandon, um, uh, the halfling thief. Back in the very beginning, creating his character. And, um, I mean, just what an amazing thing. I had no idea that you could go this far back. Um, here is um, here is Amalric, uh, Blaine. And um, he's doing some kind of a role here at this point. Um, not everybody uh, was in the previous session zeros or, or they came in with their characters. Amalric, uh, came in with his character because his character was originally in my D and D campaign, which ran several months before this campaign began. So Amalric has been with me for darn close to three years now. Um, let's see who else we have here in this uh, early on stages of this. So Calster was the um, was the druid that was originally with the party as well. So these three players, uh, word, um, the traveling, the traveling uh, 
the traveling character and Callister were three original players in the group, and they actually quit before Quescaton began. Um, here is uh, Empty Inside uh, casting a spell. Um, Birathonin? I, I don't even know what that is. Um, it's very strange. Um, it's not a spell. I'm not quite sure what that is. He'll, he'll remind me, I'm sure, what that was. That wasn't his character's name. Um, oh, Callister was Urias. Uh, he was a human paladin. All right, so now I'm remembering. So Callister was, was the human paladin that was with us in the beginning. Uh, like I said, this is such a... This is literally going back over two years ago. Um, so, yes, he was the human paladin with us. And Urias, Urias, uh, let's see who the... Um, I want to find the druid. Because we did have a druid early on. Uh, that's right, Urias the paladin. And I have it in my binder, too. I can pull up these original characters. But it's just amazing to see um, how far back this literally goes. Um, maybe Briar Thonin is his last name, Breeze's real name. Uh, that's probably what it's going to be. It's probably his character's real name. And we've just been nicknaming him Breeze ever since. So... Um, Let's see, it's just the three of them. This is still session zero. I have a hard... I, I believe that this is session zero because it looks like they're testing out the mechanics of uh, Roll20. So, um, because all I see is like combat rolls and they're testing out the mechanics of Roll20 here. So this is not even a game session just yet. It's all testing the, um, the macros. Very, very cool stuff. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if players can actually do the same thing and go through the trap, you know, go through the chat log going all the way back to the very beginning. So, this is Angus. So, Angus finally makes his appearance here and he's rolling stats as well. So, this is all session zero stuff going all the way back then. So, Really cool stuff. It was a phenomenal session. Um, we all had a great time. Um, seven out of the eight players were able to make it. Um, and their characters and all picked up 11,000, um, over 11,400 uh, experience points. Uh, that's each. And it really got me thinking as we were talking about it and and they started to really tie together, you know, one of the loose ends of the campaign. And once the players started talking about, oh, you know what, there's no chance my character is going to get to level 10 because we've been planning on bringing this, um, this campaign to a close uh, once they complete the the Keepers of Quescaton campaign quest line, you know, once they finish that off. And I kind of predict that we might have uh, potentially two, three, possibly four more sessions into it. And when my player started saying, oh, my character is never going to get to level 10, um, you know, it really started making me think. It was like, you know what? We, we don't actually have to end this campaign. We can keep on going with uh you know this ad and d campaign and i'll just create the you know the other castles and crusades campaign that we're kind of looking to launch and i would just run that on a different day um or alternate them between the two or whatever but um yeah i don't want to see this campaign end and uh, i don't think they do either so i can definitely see pushing forward with this and uh, moving that other campaign, um, the Castles and Crusades campaign, 
to a different time slot. Uh, keep this one on Tuesday nights and continue that one on a, a different day. Uh, so let me know what you think about this. My players, jump on in. Um, you know, leave your comments and everything. Uh, correct any details I might have missed out on uh, going through this. It was it was a, a two pages, you know, two very cluttered, cluttered pages of notes that I was taking while we were going through this. And uh, you know, yeah, feel free to jump in and say, hey, you know, this was my my favorite moment of the thing, and um, you know what we what I'm looking for going forward with the next step. Uh, their next step is to start delving into the uh, into the keep, and so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I just found out that I'm not working at all next week, so uh, that's going to be kind of cool because we can I can really start focusing on Tuesday and uh, doing that next session on Tuesday night, and then um, I really do have to start finishing up and tightening up my adventure for. Uh, ShireCon coming up in uh, on September 15th, so I'm running a, a game session of, uh, you know, at ShireCon, so I, I want to uh, definitely put the time into getting that adventure all set up and ready to roll, and uh, and then focusing right back to AD&D First Edition again. So, as always, thanks for joining. I hope you've been enjoying these, uh, you know, these recaps, uh, especially with this particular campaign, um, I've learned a lot running uh, AD&D First Edition these past two years. You know, and and maybe it's just refreshing my memory about you know the ways and the things that we used to do when we ran this game system uh, so many years ago. Um, you know, because I had switched to. D, &D for uh, you know quite a long time as well and so uh, running DD Beck me and and uh, or just BX versions various versions of BX and such so to come back to a D, &D uh, these past two years has really really been um, you know something that I, I think that I've I've really hit my best um, I, re I really think I hit my best uh, campaign construction uh, with this particular campaign. And, and I give all the credit to my players. I have great, great players that have really made it uh, both enjoyable and, and something I just don't want to let go. <laughs> so, uh, you, know, that's, uh, you know, that's something else that, you know, really I, I had that feeling uh, last night running through the game. I was like, I, I don't want to see this uh, campaign and this group of characters really come to an end. So I'm going to be looking to see, well, what kind of a storyline, um, what kind of a, a general campaign thrust am I going to work into um, our current campaign? Because the campaign isn't just a particular story thread that they're running through. A campaign is a is a place and a time setting and a you know events world events that are going on up and around the player characters as well as the ones that they're actually fully engaged with and and my players remember all of these little loose ends along the way uh, from the last 100 episodes or, or sessions that they're like hey you know there was that there was that uh, cleric of Farlagan that was uh, turned to stone by the Dracolisk, and we still have to track down the Dracolisk and kill that and bring that head back to the brass dragon to get the other half of the uh, the other half of the treasure that the brass dragon was holding on to, and and then we could find out the story of that particular cleric, uh, you know. So they're remembering these little loose pieces of of lore. From their own adventures and bringing it back to me and saying hey you remember this npc that we encountered uh, what's going on with that you know with that particular uh you know situation and such so like i said i i, I have players that are so invested in this campaign that it, it's it's something that i don't think any of us want to let it go so uh, as always thanks for joining i probably said this already <laughs> thanks for joining uh, and um, 
you know, just keep your eye out for more installments on the, um, the recap sessions of the Keepers of Quest Catan. Have a great evening. Take care.